Here today we have um, Mr. John Farrell from Minnesota. And Mr. John Farrell has been the director of ILSR. And we will try to ask John a little bit about uh, the background of uh, ILSR and how he's established ILSR in a few minutes. And uh, is there anything else, uh, John, you'd like to let us know before we uh, ask you more about I ILSR? Well, I should clarify, I'm the director of our Democratic Energy Program, but not of the entire institute. Okay. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about how um, the directorship of uh, Democratic Energy is uh, differentiated from the rest of the Institute? The Institute uh, is Institute of Local Self-Reliance. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And well, how long has it been established? Uh, ILSR was founded almost 40 years ago in 1974 um, and has been focused on helping uh, communities make the most of their local resources across a whole bunch of different areas, including energy, um, recycling, composting, what we call our Waste to Wealth Project. Uh, we work on independent businesses, community banking, and also publicly owned telecommunications infrastructure, which is a long way of saying uh, you know, publicly owned internet um, infrastructure, um, as seeing it as a, an essential community resource. And then, of course, in the energy field, that means figuring out how communities can make the most of their natural resources in energy, uh, both for developing for uh, clean energy, but also uh, looking at how they can capture the most of that energy dollar within their community. Yes, on the LinkedIn, I can read that it says uh, research and development of rules that encourage local ownership of renewable energy. Is that correct? To yes. increase domestic renewable energy production, economic benefits, but um, I would like to have you tell us a little bit. In recent news, I've been reading about IOSRs, uh, let's say, calling attention to the Walmarts, um, pollution, etc. So one of the uh, um, events or uh, one of the topics you're paying attention to or trying to call attention to? Certainly. You know, Walmart is actually a terrific example of the intersection between our different areas of work. The report on Walmart was actually done by my colleague, Stacey Mitchell, and she's been working on issues around Walmart and other big box stores for many years, mostly on the economic impact of these large retailers on the local economy and the fact that they tend to be very extractive, they pay fairly low wages, and most of the profits from those stores leaves the community. Um, the interesting intersection here is that Amazon, or sorry, not Amazon, although that's one of the entities she looks at, Walmart. Um, is in the news a lot for renewable energy because they are purchasing solar panels for the rooftops of Walmart stores uh, and they have made some fairly bold commitments to sustainability. Um, but what's, what, what Stacy has worked on and, and, and what I also work on in the energy sector is this notion of scale and that Walmart operates at a scale It's so big that really anything that it does um, is going to look big. But when you look at it as a sort of percentage of their overall business, renewable energy is a ver actually a very small fraction and they've not been particularly successful at reducing greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. simply because their entire model of their business is to grow, grow, grow and to ship products from uh, you know, China and places in Asia to the United States uh, over very long distances. And of course, the model of their store is that you have this large store located in a suburban area that everybody has to drive to. And so there are a lot of emissions associated with that. And so the the interesting intersection here is that not only can, is Walmart bad for the local economy in terms of com out-competing local businesses uh, and taking money out of the local economy, they're not particularly good for renewable energy or clean energy either because even though they are making some investments in things like solar, it's offset by the, the greater amount of environmental impact that their business model has. Uh, uh, we can see that distribute is especially important um, with uh, the effect of the, as a matter of fact, in Florida region, which is where I'm from, um, events such as hurricanes and um, a lot of these incidents, I can see that distributed solar will be very, very helpful. <clears throat> yeah, you know, that, the, the primary reason we focus on distributed energy at ILSR is for that um, connection into the local economy. It's this notion that if we're going to spend a dollar on energy, or on electricity in particular, how much of that dollar can we retain within in our community because every dollar that we do retain uh, tends to multiply within the community. That dollar used to, for you know, buying local energy instead of remote energy then it goes is paid to somebody who is producing that energy locally. That dollar is then re-spent within the local economy. And, and, and that's 
those benefits are borne out by the fact that the economies of scale for renewable energy uh, are there, but they're much less pronounced than they were for fossil fuels. I mean, you wouldn't build a neighborhood scale natural gas power plant. You can build a neighborhood scale community solar array. Um, that can compete economically with even uh, utility-scale solar. The difference in price is not terribly significant, especially when weighed against those economic benefits. And so we definitely focus on how do we change policy to make it, at, le at the very least, a level playing field between those community-centered, community-owned systems and the larger-scale ones that will be owned by private companies. Well, what do you think of the idea of the community solar gardens in well, I think it's a terrific idea, uh, in part because it manages to capture kind of the two essential elements. Number one, you can have that notion of community ownership that, um, you know, some entities like the Clean Energy Collective, I think, have done a really good job with in terms of maintaining the ownership principle for each individual participant. Um, but you can also capture economies of scale. Um, th there is no denying that a, a, an individual solar array on a residential rooftop simply isn't as economical as a commercial scale system on top of a big box store or, or one of those big utility scale arrays that, um, you know, uh, the Sacramento Municipal Utility in California, for example, has developed. Um, but with community solar, you can build a, a large scale array. You can still do it on rooftops. You can do it over parking lots. Um, you can still build it in the community, uh, but you can capture a lot of those economies of scale and then pass them through. And even at a relatively small scale, I actually just read about a community solar project, um, I think it's the Lake Country Cooperative um, uh, in northwestern Minnesota. Uh, their members are able to participate buying shares at $3 a watt, which is significantly less than would be the cost if they built it on their own rooftop. So I think community solar is really a great opportunity. Yes, as a matter of fact, I think uh, we've been seeing a lot of free uh, webinars available on the YouTube channels where people can actually access information in terms of what kind of steps they can take um, to get it, get it going and get it started. Um, but it would be nice to be, get the public to become more aware of this is uh, available for especially if 75% of the residents are actually having trouble in terms of uh, um, not having the right orientation of the house or they're not owning the, uh, the residence they're living in. Um, about 75% of people who couldn't fully utilize uh, rooftop solar. So this would be great, great way to do it. But in terms of uh, energy policy, um, what kind of incentive have you been looking at and what do you think is most effective in encouraging distributed solar? Well, I think that community solar policy is really essential and, and the basic building block of that is what uh, some folks call virtual net metering or community net metering. You know, over 40 states have a, a, what's called a net metering policy, which essentially lets me, when I produce energy on my own from a solar array on my roof, for example, turn back the dial on my electric meter. So for every kilowatt hour of energy I generate from that array, I'm, I'm able to get a credit equal to that on my electric bill. Um, and so it's at the, what's called the retail price. It's the, you know, if it's, I'm paying 11 cents per kilowatt hour as I do in Minneapolis, Minnesota for electricity, I save 11 cents for every kilowatt hour I generate. Now, what, what you can't do in most states is to share the output from a community solar array and, and get that same benefit. Um, the way that the electricity market has been set up, you have to sell that power to the utility, so you have to negotiate with them. Uh, a contract to buy your power, and they typically don't offer that rate, um, that retail rate, to customers um, who are having are selling power to them in the same way that they do with net metering. And uh, so the virtual net metering policy is a really a cornerstone of allowing people to get that same kind of notion of I'm saving energy by generating it myself um, without having to put it on their own rooftop, and, and allowing that to happen in a community-based setting. And then, and in my opinion, I think it would greatly expand the opportunity because in a lot of states and in a growing number every year because of the falling cost of solar, you wouldn't need additional incentives to get community solar rolling. If you simply expanded the way that net metering works to allow people to do it with, with a solar array that isn't on their own property but is shared in, a, in, in close geographical proximity, I think there would be a lot of opportunity. Uh, I understand you have uh, done a great deal in terms of... Uh um, allowing the, the most recent development of net metering in Minnesota uh, to be accomplished. And I was wondering, 
can you shed some light with our viewers on what are some of the steps you've taken? What would be the necessary steps uh, in order to get to where you have uh, um, done with the uh, the current state of the net meter in, in Minnesota? Sure. Um, before I do that, I just wanted you to know, I'm looking at your video, it kind of cuts you off around your mouth. Yeah, I didn't I know if you wanted more of your face in the video or if you're capturing it differently, I, but I just since I know you're recording. Are, that's okay. Um, I think our focus is on you. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, anyway, I, the, the, I, what, what we've done in Minnesota is uh, implement really a change to this concept of net metering uh, with what's being called a value of solar tariff. And the basic idea when we went into the legislative session was really to implement something like a feed-in tariff or a clean contract, which is, um, which is to say that I would get, when I want to produce energy from a solar array, uh, instead of using net metering, I would continue to buy all my energy from the utility and I would sell all my energy from my solar array to the utility at a fixed price for on a long-term contract, 20 or 25 years. And the idea was that the price that we come up with would be um, enough to incent the, the production of solar energy. So it would, it would include both kind of a component about the market value of solar and then also potentially an, uh, an incentive from another pot of money that would be sufficient to cover any incremental difference, as there still is in Minnesota for a lot of solar arrays, for at least for the next few years. Now, what ended up coming out of that legislative process is a great example of what I like to think of as sausage making. Um, and we got what's called this value of solar tariff, which um, utilities will be required to go through this fairly rigorous process in determining what is the market value of solar to the utility. And that will include things like um, uh, the avoided cost of transmitting electricity from distant places, distant power plants to communities, um, because the solar is on site very close to load, um, the fact that solar tends to produce during peak times, uh, the fact that it can act as a hedge against uh, fossil fuel prices to have this resource that has no fuel costs associated with it. So all those things stack together and get you a price uh, for the value of solar, which we hope will end up being in the ballpark of 12 to 13 cents a kilowatt hour. And uh, we think that with for community solar or individual solar projects, that whatever comes out of that will be pretty close to what you would need in order to make those projects financeable. Um, so you'll have a long-term contract like you would with a feed-in tariff. It will be standardized. It will be at a fixed price um, at this value of solar. And it, you know, hopefully that, that dollar amount will be high enough uh, to make it very easy to finance these community, we commu include community solar projects. It will include you know, commercial scale projects, residential projects, all, uh, everything that's under one megawatt would be covered under this system. Uh, to be honest, though, what I don't like about it is that we really had set out for it to be um, an option in addition to net metering, and so that we would continue to preserve this existing system that most people understood pretty well uh, while offering that. Um, but in the legislative process, it became an official alternative to net metering. And so a utility that adopts the value of solar would no longer offer net metering for solar for customers producing it uh, from systems one megawatt and smaller. So this value of solar system is in place, uh, is it 2013 or 2012? Uh, right now they're going through uh, a rulemaking process um, at the first at the Department of Commerce and the Public Utilities Commission. It probably won't be formally implemented until I would guess the middle of 2014. And uh, right. so we will probably try to contact you again later on about uh, as far as the percentage of people participated uh, in value of solar versus the net metering. It would be interesting to find out what is the preferred um, method of use. But well, and, and to be fair, too, what ended up happening is that only investor-owned utilities are covered under this law. And so um, that covers, I think, about two thirds of Minnesota electricity customers. The other third, who have are served either by a rural electric co-op or a municipal utility, um, will not have the value of solar option. Oh, okay. Now, are you aware of the Austin Energy's uh, value of solar that's uh, been in place? Is yes. That, can you tell us a little bit? Is there any difference, or very similar, or what are the similarity and differences between the two? I would say that Minnesota's value of solar tariff was inspired by what Austin came up with, but it is different. Um, the way that Austin's works 
is that it's a production-based incentive, which is true for Minnesota. It's a per kilowatt hour payment um, based on the value of solar. Um, so all those values that I talked about adding up to a certain amount. But the, the key difference is that Austin's adjusts every year. So when I sign up for their program, in 2013, I might get 10 cents a kilowatt hour. In 2014, I might get 12 cents per kilowatt hour I produce. So it changes every year. In Minnesota, what's going to happen is that if I install my solar array next year in 2014 under this value of solar program, I'll get the same price for every kilowatt hour I produce for 20 or 25 years, the entire length of the contract. So it's a fixed price. And I think that is... Um, well, it's, a, it's a very positive difference in the sense that when we are looking at driving down the cost of solar, specifically from the standpoint of financing costs for how much it costs to borrow money, that long-term fixed price contract is going to be a lot better for driving down the borrowing costs for folks who want to install solar um, than is the variable price uh, that they have in Austin. I was also talking to some of the people in the solar industry. As a matter of fact, um uh, interesting to find out that uh, a lot of the solar panels, for example, has warranty, even though they only have warranty for 20, 25 years, but realistically, they can last up to 50 years or so. so I, mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a great point to make. It, it makes me laugh a little bit because during the legislative session, there were, there were legislators who were saying, well, we shouldn't be doing stuff with solar in Minnesota. We have no record of how these things operate in Minnesota over the long term and I just you know I, I kind of wanted to point out that there's probably nothing else you can buy that has a 25 year warranty uh, in any field energy or otherwise um, so we certainly have some guarantees out of, of good performance um, but you know I think that's a really good point you know even with this the long term contracts we're going to get with value of solar in Minnesota the solar panels are likely to outlive that contract term and it's not really clear at this point what's going to happen after that point um, there might be an opportunity to re-up the contract, um, uh, maybe at a different price, however, at whatever that price is currently, uh, which may be a lot lower, frankly. Um, that you know, there's an acknowledgement that as more and more, excuse me, there's an acknowledgement that as more and more solar comes onto the system in Minnesota, uh, you know, we're talking about 10% of the electricity generation, 15%, very high numbers, uh, but possible within that that long time frame of a contract that the value of solar to the grid might be lower because we'll have so much energy from solar already producing at peak times or, or, or whatnot, and that it will be more of a, um, there will be less value that uh, the utility sees and that might market price may be lower. Yes, and as a matter of fact, Minnesota is a much older state than the Texas. So there, it would be interesting to see, uh, what compare the result from the two different states also. Mm -hmm. And let me see, as far as... Um, FIT, the feed-in tariff and net metering, um, what do you foresee the establishment of these two policies versus the value of solar? Do you think values of solar will simply become a more and more uh, uh, favored and uh, the feed-in tariff and net metering will simply become something of the put in the back, back burner or would, do you think both policy will go forward or well, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, you know, net metering is a very simple to understand policy in the sense that it treats energy generation just like conservation. Mm -hmm. Basically, every additional kilowatt hour that I don't need to get from the utility is treated the same. So that's the same as if I turn my lights off as if I produce energy from solar. And I think that simplicity is really useful. Um, what's ended up happening around that, though, is that be it tends to obscure the costs and benefits of solar and other distributed energy generation to the utility in a way that has allowed utilities to complain that net metering um, is a cost shift from people who generate energy to those who don't. Um, I, you know, I, there, as part of this value of solar process in Minnesota, there was a, the Rocky Mountain Institute did a really nice survey of the different studies around the costs and benefits uh, associated with net metering. And they found that, you know, generally speaking, the costs and benefits are pretty equal, if not slightly, in favor of the utility in terms of, uh, you know, the benefits of taking solar through this, this retail price reimbursement scheme uh, compared to not taking it. And so I, I feel like, um, you know, that's, a, that's a, a battle that has to be won by solar and distributed generation advocates, and it's played out in places like Arizona most prominently. 
but it's not the death of the policy. And, uh, um, and, I, and I think there's still some definitely good uses for net metering, especially as I mentioned before with um, community solar, if you have virtual net metering, it's a great way in a way that makes a lot of sense, I think, for people, this notion that I would get to share the electricity output rather than having kind of a dollar figure tied to it as an investment. Um, that being said, you know, the value of solar in my mind really is, uh, at least if it's implemented in other places as it has been done in Minnesota, it's really a, a, a way to take the best pieces of a feed-in tariff and, and to implement them. You know, a standardized contract is all about making it as legally simple as possible to reduce reduce as much as possible the amount of lawyers that you need in order to sign a power purchase agreement mm -hmm. and to make it as easy as possible for people uh, to be renewable energy generators. The length of the contract uh, helps bring down the borrowing costs and that fixed price as well is really key to that. Um, really the only difference between what Minnesota is doing with the value of solar and a, and a kind of quote unquote true feed-in tariff it is that the price is based on the value calculation of what solar is worth to utility as opposed to the cost of generating power from that resource as they do in Germany. Um, and, and really, it, it, uh, and, and when, when we set out uh, in Minnesota with this value of solar, the notion that we would basi we'd basically have two pots of money. One would come from the utility, and that would be this value of solar amount. And then the incremental amount on the top would come from you know, maybe a, a surcharge on electric bills that would pay the rest of that way to the cost of generation. And that over time, that cost of generation piece, that subsidy, if you will, that incentive from that public fi uh, fund would eventually expire because you would no longer need it because the value of solar would be sufficient to cover the cost on a long-term contract. So, you know, I think my idea would be that for small-scale systems uh, where you have a lot of little producers, you're not going to want to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one negotiation with the utility, uh, a lot of transaction costs associated with that. The feed-in tariff is still a really good model, and really it's going to come down to, I, uh, I think, how transparent can we be with the costs and the value of the energy that we're generating, and where do we want to get the money for that? I think the traditional feed-in tariff person would say, the money's going to come from the same place anyway. It's coming from ratepayers, so why not just pay people what it costs to generate from renewables? And I think the value of solar is kind of the... Um, sort of the utility 2.0 answer, which is to say, we only want to pay what it's worth. We want it to be transparent. Uh, and if you want to uh, you know, pay people what it costs to generate renewables, get the additional incentive from some other pot of money, from you know, an income tax or something like that, rather than from rate pairs. Right. And your point about the uh, amount of uh, regulatory stuff that's necessary in terms of uh, being a power generation, a mm -hmm. power generator, it's uh, probably going to be a lot of work for those who are trying to produce the power. So the value of solar is probably going to be bypassing a lot of that part of the necessary requirements, so to speak. So it's probably going to be much more, it's easier to deal with um, as far as consumers are concerned. For sure. And I think all of these, these uh, policy tools, net metering, value of solar feed-in tariffs, are really focused on that you know, smaller scale distributed renewable energy market whether that's at one megawatt, like we said in Minnesota, or five megawatts, it's really focused on the, you know, the on-site generation, you know, near or on top of buildings that use energy. For the big power producers who want to build big power plants and sell that power wholesale or, or participate in an energy market, a feed-in tariff or whatnot is probably not necessary uh, or, or not worth the regulatory oversight to develop. What do you foresee? Do you think it's possible that one of these days we will be uh, able to reach um, basically within 10 years or so 100% um, renewable? Well, I, I would be very skeptical of 10 years um, because I think when you get to fairly high penetrations of renewables, you do have some technical limitations that we haven't yet figured out how to deal with. Um, that being said, you know, the Germans are just in the process of kind of revamping their goals around renewables and I believe by 2030 they're talking about 55 to 60 percent renewable on their electricity system. Uh, I think that's achievable in the United States as well. There's no reason to think that we can't out innovate the Germans. Mm -hmm. um, now that the trick I think is going to be do we have the policy set up to capture the most of that economic benefit? Um, it's one thing to say we're going to set a renewable portfolio standard of 60 percent by 2030 which would be by itself a fairly significant political achievement. But if we just did that, it means that the utility is kind of in control of that entire market. 
and the economic benefits, which are very substantial for generating renewable energy, won't flow to the people who have that resource. You know, you talk about the wind resource in southwestern Minnesota, the farmers who own that land, the communities that are located there. I think they should be benefiting significantly from the tapping of that resource. And in a lot of cases, they're not because they're simply leasing out their land and their wind rights or their solar rights uh, to big um, multinational uh, utility companies. And so I think it's really important that the policy framework, whether it's a value of solar tariff or a feed-in tariff or what have you, give an opportunity as we reach those really high levels of renewable energy uh, for us to always have really high levels of local ownership and a really a strong opportunity for communities to make the most of their local renewable energy resources. You can see that historically policy really sets the tone and determines the rate of increase of uh, the spread of the renewable. This makes a tremendous difference. Um, how, long, how long have you been doing this? That's really what I'm also curious about. How starting point of you trying to make some changes or trying to seek improvement for IOSR or uh, more of a local self-reliance established uh, policies? Well, I think it was uh, one of our first studies that, about the local potential to generate energy from solar was in 1975. And it looked at the opportunity in Washington, D.C. Uh, for the how much energy could be generated from rooftops and uh, how much uh, energy dollar could be kept within the community. Um, so you can, as you can see, we've been at this for quite a long time. Um, personally, I've been involved in it about seven years, uh, which is about enough time to uh, know enough to be dangerous and uh, get myself in trouble um, <laughs> and to know a lot more about what I don't know. Um, but we continue to, you know, we, we've set up, I think, a pretty good um, intellectual framework around this notion of local ownership and the local energy dollar needing to be the center of the policy conversation around renewables. And, and from there, it becomes a question of what are the policies that we push for most uh, that can accomplish that. So maybe it's feed-in tariffs in some communities. Maybe it's virtual net metering. Uh, maybe it's like we have in Minnesota. We're having a conversation about how we uh, change state regulation of utility franchise contracts. These are agreements that are renewed usually on a 20-year cycle with uh, in, you know, private utility companies uh, and cities. And you know, giving cities more leeway to push the envelope on renewables with their utilities as part of those contracts. Um, we always like to look for how we can get the most local authority, uh, give cities and towns and communities the most flexibility to push the envelope locally so that we don't always have to wait around for the, uh, you know, the, the political alignment at the state or federal level to, to make progress on climate and energy. Well, do you have any more specific tips as to how we can encourage the local um, authorities or a local, uh, um, let's say, establishment of such a distributed power? Or? That's a great question. It gives me a perfect segue. Um, I actually just published a report in October called City Power Play, and it focuses on eight local policies um, that cities can use that um, can boost their uh, in a clean local energy and their economy. Uh, and so it talks about things like municipal utilities and making the most of that opportunity all the way down to things like building codes or uh, requiring disclosure of building energy use to help create a market for energy efficient buildings. Um, so there are a lot of great tools in there um, that I think are important because some of them are simply uh, pieces that can be implemented at the local level. Some of them lend themselves to things that you would have to focus on in terms of changing state policy to uh, give more power and authority to local communities. And that's really good. And um, I understand you uh periodically would provide a seminar or a lecture or uh, kind of a discussion with people who are interested in finding out more about uh, ILSR um, or any kind of a policy that will be encouraging or helpful with, the I, with local distributed power. And uh, if there are any people who are interested in getting into this, um, how is the best way to contact you? Well, I think the first thing I would suggest is people check out our website, um, which is ILSR.org. Um, the energy program is ILSR.org slash energy. Uh, pretty easy to find. And just take a look at the enormous uh, library of resources we have there. Um, I've had a blog now for about three and a half years where I've um, really tried to showcase a lot of the kind of economic and philosophical arguments around 
uh, local and democratic energy. Um, we've got a podcast series now where I um, do interviews with other folks who are really out there creating the interesting models of, of local ownership. Um, everything from the Clean Energy Collective and their community solar model to uh, an interview I'm going to be publishing later this week on, with the Farmers Electric Co-op in Iowa and uh, the way that they've had almost 20% of their members participate in some sort of renewable energy or solar program. Um, and we also, you know, as you mentioned, I'm giving presentations. All the presentations I give are, are posted on our website, um, some with video and audio and uh, otherwise at least just the, the slides that I use from the PowerPoint, um, often very visually oriented for the folks who don't want to spend a lot of time reading the reports, which are, of course, also there. Um, but I'm also available by, by email and phone and Skype and Twitter and all those things. Um, email is usually the best way to get a hold of me. It's jfarrell at ilsr.org. Any final say you would like to have for uh, kind of a encouraging or any pointer for all those of us who are out here with similar interest and who would like to see renewable and solar energy to spread as quickly as possible? I think, you know, my summary is always that we should focus on how, well, it's so important to focus on the intersection of, of local and democratic energy with renewables for two reasons. One is that the economic intersection is something that makes it interesting to people of all political stripes. The, the opportunity to boost the local economy is something that matters to conservatives and liberals, you know, progressives. Um, and, and, and that, I think, leads into even the more important piece, which is the political, that it's, it's a difficult and divisive conversation about climate change that we have right now that is spilling over into our conversations about renewable energy um, because of the politics. Um, but if we, if we come at it from an angle of, of the local economy, of, of autonomy, of democratic ownership, um, it starts to break apart uh, those political chains uh, and, and to make it really a broad and significant political movement in favor of maximizing and accelerating renewable energy. Yes, that would uh, definitely is important to approach from that perspective. And we really appreciate your time. And, uh, and I understand that uh, there will be uh, additional ILSR meetings, and we'll definitely try to tap into that. And really appreciate you, everything you've done in Minnesota, because that would help us here in Florida to um, really uh, learn the lesson that you have done, and also the work you've done at the uh, value of solar or modified a, um, a net metering at uh, Minnesota. So really, we're, we do appreciate that. Thank you very much. And we will definitely try to get more people to become aware of city power planning or play, city power play, right? Is yes. it available at Amazon.com? Uh, it's on our website, ilsr.org, free PDF download. All right, great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. And You're welcome, have Susan. a wonderful holiday and uh, wonderful Wonderful week. Thanks, you too. Thank you.